Gatekeeper, open the portals Between the gods and mortals Power freely flows As our magic grows Blessed one, laurel crowned and honey tongued Golden and shining, first among the poets Who caresses the lyre's strings with the touch of a lover we beg of you, guide our tongues, and place upon our lips pleasing words that they may lie lightly upon the ears which receive them. Inspire us with song and verse, cast your radiance upon us. So blessed may we take in your beauty and reflect it back. May we be filled with the awe and reverence. May we, too, speak as though from the hearts of poets. May our worship do justice to those in whom we honored Blessed Apollo, we offer you these bay leaves. Accept our offering. Accept our offering. Hi, I'm Aaron. And I'm Jonathan. And you're listening to Part the Mist. A podcast by a couple of ADF druids here in Portland, Oregon. Yes, hey, number hey, two time hey, getting that right. Hey, I can do things. <laughs> I can do things. <laughs> well, welcome, dear listeners. You have... You get to listen to Jonathan and Aaron talk to each other again. Did you miss us last month? I bet you did. <laughs> Jonathan, how are you doing? <laughs> um, I've been doing pretty well, actually. A couple of uh, major life changes going on with me. Well, yeah, you're not senior druid anymore. Well, that's <laughs> that's that's not necessarily the big life change, oh. but no, yeah, <laughs> trying to trying to improve your um, importance or trying to to expand upon your importance. I see. I, see. I understand. I've, I've been there. It's okay. It's all right. No, um, some big changes with myself is I have come out. Um, I am, you know, I, I uh, some big things. I've again, I've come out of the closet. So I just ended a relationship of four years. So now I'm doing this whole self discovery thing. And so there's a lot going on in my life right now. Which which closet did you come out of, Jonathan? The gay closet. Okay. Not the pagan closet. I'm already <laughs> out of that, so not not the bisexual closet. No, no, not that one. So so good news from Jonathan. And yes. we are all very happy for you and and your your self discovery. Yeah, it's it's gonna be a long road, but you know. It is what it is. Yeah. Well, we all we all have long roads to walk. Exactly. In other news, I have actually received a promotion, so uh, my my life is getting a little bit more hectic, but also a lot more solid. So it's good news all around. Uh, but it definitely is keeping me busy. But we have a. It, a lot in store for you for our episode this month. Yes, you did an interview with the Arch Druid Drum. I did. Our current Arch Druid Drum, a.k.a., and let's hopefully I'll get this right, Jean Pagano. Uh, we talk about that a little bit in the, in, the drum, in the interview, but you'll get to hear that in just a couple of minutes here. We also have recording from Reverend Sean. Yes, Reverend Sean. He um he leads the or he runs the hospitality suite at Pantheon, the ADF hospitality suite. I asked him if he could send in a little a little uh, recording of himself talking about what is Pantheon and the hospitality suite that ADF holds there. Cool. So we'll be talking about well he'll be talking about that. Uh, we also have for our music today we have something very special. We've had, yeah, we've had uh, people sending in music to our email now, so we are going to be playing for you the Hymn to the Morgan by... By Isaac Bonowitz, a song by Eric of Pittsburgh. Yes. And... Who is the founder of the Sassafras Grove in, 80, uh, in Pittsburgh. Yes, yeah, so that's exciting. We, uh, we're going to finish the show off with Reverend Kirk Thomas from reading from the archives. Um, and then we'll, that will be the show for today. So to wrap everything up with us, we got one piece of fan mail we would love to go ahead and read. Arn, would you go ahead yeah. and read that for us? Greetings. I've wanted to write you guys since you aired your first episode, but life gets in the way. However, I just wanted to say how much I enjoy your podcast. The chemistry between you two is awesome. The content of the podcast is quite enjoyable as well. Yet, I wanted to share that you two have changed my whole outlook on the ADF. 
Here in Connecticut, the local ADF group is known as a Celtic Reconstructionist group, so naturally one would extend such a label to the entire organization. Indeed, as a Druid myself, I came to a similar conclusion about the ADF during my research of Druid organizations available to me. You two have opened my eyes to how diverse the ADF can be. In fact, I have started raving about it in my local magic slash pagan groups to the vault of knowledge of that ADF possesses. No worries, I do plan on joining and enjoying the wonderful privileges therein. Anywho, wanted to share that with you guys. Carry on. Cheers, Daniel. Thank you so much, Daniel. I, I, I don't know about Jonathan, but I'm completely flattered. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, we do appreciate the fan mail we get, and it does make us feel like we are, in fact, fighting a service to those listeners out there and kind of explaining what ADF mm. is and the fact that it is a pretty awesome organization. Oh, and it's always good to hear that the podcast is helping expand people's views and perspectives. Mm. All right, enough of us talking, I guess. Yeah. Let's go ahead and start the interview. All right, so I am here today with our current Arch Druid. Um, and do you prefer just drum? It's easier that way. Sure, drum is good. Okay, because <laughs> I'm I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. Oh, it's Jean, Jean Pagano, but drum is easier. All right, so um, that so. Uh, that was Jean Pagano. Pagano, you said. Pagano. Yeah, it's Pagano. Ah. Right. <laughs> Jean Pagano. Um, but he prefers to go. Or uh, drum is e- easier. Um, yes. And I'm just kind of repeating because you did cut out a little bit there. So, uh, <laughs> drum is recording on his iPhone today. So this will be a bit of a new experiment for the podcast. Um, and and hopefully it won't be too bad of a one. Here's hoping. <laughs> so, um, to start things out, I, I like to start at the very beginning and find out a little bit about what brought you to the Pagan Path. Wow. Um, <laughs> brought to the Pagan Path was uh, when I was in grade eight, uh, we studied Edith Hamilton's mythology. And I was fascinated with the stories of the Greek gods. And when it came time for the test, one of the questions on the test was, um, the Greek gods are still worshipped today. And I said, true, because I couldn't, you know, it just seemed common sense to me that that was the case. And I got it marked wrong. Uh, So I questioned the teacher about it, and she told me that, you know, this... These were ancient gods, and they weren't worshipped anymore, that the Judeo-Christian god was being worshipped. I mean, that was for the course for 19 whatever it was at the time so um but i really see the family mythology and i kept studying it and i felt that um the gods weren't dead they weren't distant that they were still vital so i um went from public school to catholic school the next year and so I, I decided to keep on working with the greek gods with some success i did some magical workings and um, that was really my introduction to paganism. Uh, I, I really didn't know what I was doing other than what Edith Hamilton talked about. And that kept me going for quite a while. And uh, so that's how I first got into paganism. I, uh, what got, brought me to the next step was I, I bought a book um, in the late 70s or maybe 1980 called Drawing Down the Moon by Margot Adler. Uh-huh. And I found it really fascinating um, that, you know, there was all this diversity out there of religious thought, and, you know, paganism made sense to me, and I found this, I was interested in druids, it was just something that kind of appealed to me, so there was a contact in there for the new reformed druids of North America, and the contact person was a gentleman named Isaac Bonowitz. So I got in touch with Isaac, and I said, hey, I want, a new, I want to know more about Druids. I want to know about the new Reformed Druids of North America. And he's like, well, I would be glad to tell you all about that, but I'm starting this new group, and for $35, you can get in on the ground floor. So I sent uh, Isaac $35, and I was one of the first 
a handful of people to join ADF, and that was 1984, March 10th, 1984. And uh, that was my beginnings in paganism and really my beginnings in, uh, in ADF. Awesome. That's, uh, I, that's so cool that you remember the exact day. Well, it's, it's funny. It, it was my, um, it's my mother's birthday. So that was oh. kind of, easy. and for whatever reason, because I do save the strangest things, I saved the check, the canceled check that I sent Isaac huh. and, uh, I still have it today, so the date's on there, and uh, so that's how I remember it um, more than anything, but March 10th, 1984. Cool. So uh, what have you been doing with ADF? Wow. <laughs> that's a big question. Um, I was a solitary for about 20 years. Mm-hmm. I had um, approached a grove that was not too far from where I was, and in the early days and I didn't think that that we were quite a really good match and I kind of enjoyed doing the solitary thing uh so I just uh, I stayed with that uh at the time when I first joined there was a basically it was a newsletter called uh Druid's Progress mm-hmm. uh so I started getting Druid's Progress number 1 and then over the years uh there would be other publications that were called News from the Mother Grove and other ADF publications, and I think early members, really, that was something that we waited on, like with bated breath. It was, you know, more, it was kind of more revelations from Isaac and and more ways of doing things and insights. So I really uh, looked forward to those things and tried, you know, doing rituals on my own and honoring the high days and honoring, I honored the moons as well during that time period. And so I kind of built a a practice based on what was available at the time, which was a little bit different than than the core order, but um, it was still a a good way to practice, and it made a lot of sense to me. So I just kind of followed the life plan there for about 20 years, and uh, after a series of moves, I found myself living in Michigan. And um, I had communicated with uh, Protogrove when I was living in Minnesota, and that protogrove didn't last very long. And when I got here to Michigan, I decided to go visit Shining Lakes Grove. Uh, this was in the early 2000s. Mm-hmm. And I did uh, went to one of the rituals, and I was immediately kind of drawn into the, the, the way they did things. Uh, the priest, uh, the senior druid was uh, Rob Henderson, still is Rob Henderson. Mm-hmm. And I just loved the way that he... Um, ran ritual and it was different than what, how I had practiced but I'd been practicing by myself and it was so nice to practice with other people and uh, Fox who was the former arch druid and uh, who was also at one point senior druid of Shining Lakes Grove was around a bit mm-hmm. so I got to speak with him and so that was really my introduction to doing more um, public things with, with ADF as opposed to being a solitary and I started going to all the rituals. I became a member of Shining Lakes Grove. And so I just started practicing with them and and keeping on with my regular druid practices. And at some point, I became a little more involved in in things with ADF. I became the list master. I became original druid. I became the chief of the council of regional druids. And so I became involved with ADF on more of a national level. Um, I got involved with the list master because at the time, the kind of mid to late 2000s, the lists were kind of wild and wooly. And I thought that, you know, I could help out. And um, so took a bunch of courses. I did my Dedekin program after a while and then started in the study programs and other stuff. So I kind of did a lot of different things in ADF and really liked what I saw and especially liked the people that I saw and uh, the things that I experienced there, festivals and rituals. and So uh, that's kind of a, the Cliff Notes version of what I did uh, in ADF. But um, I think it was interesting because it gave me a chance to see what life was like as a solitary, mm-hmm. uh, which seemed very normal to me. And then doing 
you know, rites with uh, groves also seem very normal as well. But mm-hmm. you know, I kind of waffled back and forth from grove practice to solitary practice, and it's uh, I think I understand the beauty and the challenges of both. Mm, for sure. I, I don't know if this is just me coming from younger generation or not, but I've, I, it's it, doing solitary. Um, it seems like in the early, in the, in the, you know, eighties and nineties, solitary was a lot more likely to be the case. Right. Um, it's, it's been very difficult for me. I've never been very, a very good solitary, but <laughs> Yeah, I, you're absolutely right. That was the kind of the norm. I, there were a number of groves uh, in the early days that um, that were large and some not so large, but um, I didn't know any different because I chose not to join my local grove. Uh, mm-hmm. I did think solitary wise, and I found that it was you know it was fulfilling. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was really wasn't until I joined a grove and saw how much more there was there and um it really i kind of i think deepened my understanding about some of the some of the things or some of the nuances of ritual that i perhaps didn't understand i mean a lot of it was organic i took the books that i had the magazines the druids progresses and oak leaves and kind of tried to build what i did from what i found in there and it was uh there was no manual there was nothing that said this is the way to do it nowadays uh, there are much, many more things. I mean, podcasts, and for example, or mm-hmm. YouTube, things of that nature. It, it's it's much easier to f- to find the way. And then it was kind of hit miss. And um, I think you know there were a lot of hits and some misses, but uh, it is it is easier, I think, to be in in a grove. And it's you learn a lot more. I think it's easier because you get to see how other people do things, and that's that was the biggest. Uh, windfall for me was watching what Shining Lakes did, and I'm sure you could fit any Grove's name in there, right. but it uh, really informative. Right. Well, it's, it's a wonderful exchange of information too. Absolutely. But, like, um, I and I mean, you just you don't get that kind of exchange uh, through the lists, for example, or through Facebook. Right. Um. So I'm 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 going to side sidetrack us a little bit. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, how how do you feel? How do you feel about the differences? Speaking of the exchange of information, how do you feel about the differences between like the Druid Progress, the email list, and now we have Facebook, which is where we're doing a lot of our information exchange in ADF. Well. Looking at Druid's Progress and Oak Leaves, they're, they were really, um, it was like manna falling from heaven because here's this this great publication that would come in my uh, in the mailbox and it would tell you what was going on with the Mother Grove and what had been happening in ADF and articles about what was important in ADF and some rituals. So that was like, it was kind of like having... Um, you know, these little books that would come in the mail with, with things that you could try. You could, you know, do try this at home. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that was very passive because it's basically you reading out of a book and then kind of reconstructing what someone said, you know, two-dimensionally uh, in, a, in a three-dimensional practice. So that was kind of hard. And it was uh, some writers were better than others. But uh, I tell you what, those were great. Those were great publications because of beautiful artwork Um, and great stories and it was if you couldn't go to festival it was like the next best thing because it was a way to understand what other people are doing the lists were kind of nice because they were uh, there was a lot of information it was a way to keep track of things Uh, before Facebook that was really you know the way that information was exchanged and I think that over time it became a very civil way of exchanging information Mm -hmm. Uh, but once again, it was it wasn't as vibrant and as dynamic as Facebook is, where things happen in real time. Right now, you'd write an email and you'd wait for a response. Uh, there, you know, Facebook allows uh, much more rapid sharing of information 
uh, than than any of the other the other two medium. It's really the whereas print print publications really were passive. Facebook is really active. Um, it's just a, it's a very different beast. Uh, information exchange flows quickly, and you know other things flow quickly as well in Facebook. Some of it good, some of it bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's you know with a lot of the you know different Facebook groups that have you know information about solitaries and information about the DP and those kind of things. Those are really well done, and if they're well managed and well moderated. It's a joy. It really is nice to see people come together and and exchange things. And even you know, we've seen people do things on in real time, whether it's rituals or otherwise. And that's very exciting. I think it's part of what helps us grow and and get out to more people. If you have if you have Facebook, for example, I think in much greater than lists. Even though you may be alone, your your access to other individuals is is much more immediate and and much more real time. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that answered your question, but it's it's just a progress, a different progression of things, and um, I think that you know we've we're moving in the right direction. Uh, I I miss the lists in some way because it's easy to go back and and look through the lists and follow things. Where in Facebook yeah. you have to scroll through ten thousand messages, but yes, yeah. Facebook um, can be very uh, overwhelming. Yes, it's true. And when sometimes when fires start in, in Facebook, they they flame very quickly. But uh, yes, I've been very happy with our moderation team at ADF. The uh, the moderators we have are really really top notch, and uh, we have good people on our Facebook page, and I think they really try very hard to exchange information and, and really bring what we're doing forward. Absolutely. So uh, you are our current Arch Druid. What motivated you to run for this position? Hmm. Um, I've always wanted to, to help ADF, and I, I believe in Isaac's vision. I mean, Isaac's vision is kind of this thing. It's, it's the lamp that everybody seems to stand around or the fire that everybody tries to burn themselves around. Um, I became active in, in international ADF a few a number of years ago, and I ran for Vice Archdruid because I wanted to help out Kirk Thomas. Uh, the Archdruid's position is pretty broad. I mean, if, looking at it from the sidelines, it, it doesn't seem as broad as it is. And I'm not going to say that I'm, you know, Atlas carrying the world on my shoulders. That's surely not the case. But I just wanted to kind of help out. And when Kirk decided to step down, uh, which I think surprised a lot of us, um, I thought, well, I'm the vice arch druid. I, I kind of know my way around the organization. And uh, I thought, well, let me give it a try. And so I ran for the position. And I was, you know, fortunate enough to, to win that position. Tell us a little bit of what you do as Archdruid. Wow. Uh, <laughs> there's, uh, you know, the Archdruid is, um, we are always looking, at, well, I'll, I don't want to sound like I'm going to say we. I'm always looking for ways to um, make ADF pal- palatable to other people. I think we have a really great um, organization, and I think we have a really great church here. The beauty and power of, of one of the things that we do is the core order of ritual, which is um, allows us to go to any grove or proto-grove in the world and know what to expect. And I think that the core order is broad enough to allow people to, you know, worship without feeling constrained, but but also has enough space in it where people can do things that are enriching for them. Uh, in the working section, for example, or, um, you know, having group offerings or having other people come and do offerings. Uh, I think that that's one of the things that I try to show people. I do a lot of festivals every year. I do the ADF festivals. Um, we don't make many, uh, you know, we don't, I think, get a lot of new members at ADF, ADF festivals because we already have ADF members. But mm-hmm. I've been trying to go to what we call pan-pagan festivals, things like um 
CMA in Texas or Pan Pagan or Chrysalis Moon um, or these uh, any festivals like this Mount Franklin in Australia, going there and showing people what, what ADF looks like. And I found a lot of times that people um, really like that. So part of it is is trying to get the um, – trying to get the message out. I think that what we have is a good thing, and I'd like people to know about it. I'm not proselytizing. I'm not mm-hmm. standing on corners handing out pamphlets, but I want people to see what we have because I believe in what we do. Uh, so that's one of the things we do or that I do. There are always emails. Uh, there are always telephone calls. Uh, we have an international organization, so it is not unusual for me to get phone calls uh, all throughout the day or Facebook messages or emails, people trying to reach me, asking me questions, looking for information. So part of it is information um, gathering and dissemination. People need information. So it's I'm kind of a facilitator in some ways. Uh, we do have an organization to run. So they're the Mother Grove, of which I'm one of nine members. Uh, we, you know, our task is to continue with Isaac's vision, in my opinion, and also to, you know, make sure that the organization runs smoothly. Uh, that's, that's one of the tasks that I do. We try to um, do things with study programs, with the clergy, with mm-hmm. all across the board to try to make our organization interesting, not only for our members, but other, other potential people as well. We have a lot of really talented people in the organization, and I try to, um, you know, point people in the right direction if they need help or in the right direction if they need information. We have so many people with so many skills and so much knowledge. So a lot of it is just trying to move things along in, in the way they need in the, that they need to go to. Um, I do a lot of traveling for ADF. Uh, it's something that I I chose a number of years ago when I was Vice Arch Druid. Um, most of the travel that I do is um, I take care of myself uh, because I want to get out there and meet people. Mm-hmm. Uh, part of it is not only uh, that I want to do this for ADF. I, I'm also curious. I love to go see how people practice, whether it's groves or proto-groves or other organizations. Um, I think it's, it's in, informative for people to, you know, for people to see what other people do. And I also think one of the most important tasks that I have is to give a face to ADF. I mean, I'm not all of ADF. I'm one person in ADF. Right. But I think it's good for our members, wherever they may be located, to see that it's more than just um, a two-dimensional image on Facebook or a name uh, in in an email list or a byline in a, in a magazine to see that there's actually somebody out there in leadership. And we have a number of leaders in ADF who do travel and go see people, and that's that's part of my job as well. Outreach, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and and part of a part of our our duties, and I think my duties is to, um, you know, is to is to help. So. We are a service organization, I think, especially leadership, and, and we try our best to help people and, and the, you know, the Earth Mother and all, and all the yes. things that we hold dear. Yes. Yeah, yeah I, was, I mean, when you, when you speak of uh, bringing, a, bringing a third dimension to ADF, I, I, that, that is something that resonates, resonates well with me. Um, so one of the things that that resonates really well with me because I find myself very fortunate in getting to do this podcast because I I now get the opportunity to reach out and to talk to some of these faces and names that I see on Facebook and I see on in the email lists all the time. I mean these are these are the names these are the bylines on the ADF website and I I get the opportunity to reach out and talk to you and it becomes it it helps make it helps make the people of ADF more approachable i think for me oh that's awesome and that's important yes um and that could just that could be i don't know if that's an introvert uh, <laughs> response or not um making it more approachable but it's definitely very exciting that i that i get the opportunity to do this and i i, I totally understand i mean it's it's 
I think a lot of the people that you've talked to are very approachable and, um, mm-hmm. you know, like to share. And I think we were, at least I can look at myself, you know, when I first started in this, you know, I, I think I was fairly introverted just because of solitary practice. You kind of mm-hmm. do your thing. And then when you actually have to get out there and, and do things with other people, it kind of broadens you a little bit. And, and talking to others is such, a, you know, I learned so much from other people. Um, I just can't say how much I've gained from them. Absolutely. Uh, so do you have any personal goals, Any anything that you'd like to see um, improved with an ADF in your time as Archdruid? Well, I um, we are growing as an organization. We're, at, we're pretty well, um, I don't want to say established, but we've made a lot of inroads into different parts of America. Um, you know, I would love to see a Grove or a Proto Grove in all 50 states. Um, that would be really exciting for me. We have uh, a number of members in Canada, uh, which is, is also a wealth of, of uh, membership and practice and interesting folks. But we're also growing in other parts of the world. We have members in Brazil. We have a, a Proto Grove down there. They do remarkable work. Uh, we have um, a grove in Australia. We have a number of people in different provinces in Australia. Uh, and we have members in, uh, in Africa. We have members in Russia. We have members in Europe. We're going to ordain most likely our first priests in, in Europe this year. Um, so I, I just I want to see our international organization grow, and I want people to see that, um, you know, ADF is not just an American thing. It is really an international thing. And, you know, what I saw when I was in Brazil was that here are Celtic Reconstructionists who speak Portuguese and Mm do more order of ritual. And we have members in Germany who have German sections of our website and have translated a number of things into German and do their, their rituals in German and we can say this for a number of countries that people are starting to develop uh, ADF in their own in their own kind of national maybe national is not the right word but regional images. Uh, so I think that I'd like to see ADF grow more broadly international as well as growing here in the United States. That's one of the things I would like to see. I would um, you know I'd like for us to be more widely known. I don't know how to do that. I mean, we do it by talking to people and by showing people what we do. But um, one of the things I've worked on recently is reaching out to other Druidic leaders um, throughout the world who are members of or the heads of other Druidic organizations. And I want to set up time to talk to them and to share information. Um, The idea there isn't necessarily to you know, to convert Obad Druids to become ADF Druids right. or, or whatever the case or vice versa, but just to say, you know, where are our commonalities and where where do we share, what do we share in practice and, and work together with each, with each other. We've seen this with already some of our people in ADF that go to Obad things, that go to other other um, groups as well. And I, I think it's, this is a good way to share information where it's a good way to broaden our own perspective. So I'd like for us to broaden our perspectives. Uh, I would like to see us, you know, work on our practice and, and really work on, on Isaac's vision. There's a lot of things in the vision that I think uh, that we are, we are currently working on. And I'm very excited about that. A lot of it doesn't have to do with me. It just happens to be happening at the same time. We have groves that are starting to tell, um, to, you know, video, um, and broadcast mm-hmm. their rituals. This is very exciting. Uh, yeah. Isaac wanted us to have centers of worship in cities around the country and around the world. That's going to take a little bit longer. But being able to take um, a ritual that's done in upstate New York or done in Columbus, Ohio, or done wherever the case may be and broadcasting it to people is huge and is, mm-hmm. is very important. Um, so I just want to be able to reach more people and to, you know, help our own practice, um, you know, help serve the folk of ADF and, and also 
honor the gods, love the land. All these things are very important. Um, you know, we develop, I think that we do our best work when we continue our practices, our devotional practices and our ritual practices. And so the other thing that I, I want to accomplish as Arch Druid is, um, it's great if people can do ritual. I think that's, that's a great thing to do that for high days, but we don't always have the luxury of doing rituals every day. Uh, that's a lot to ask for people. But I think if people establish devotional practices where they honor a god or a, or a spirit of nature or whatever the case may be, where they honor something every day, I think it builds a personal practice in themselves that helps develop a discipline there and also helps build relationships between themselves and, and one or more of the kindreds. And I think that this this is a richness of practice that I think uh, makes people's lives more interesting and better, and also I think helps them uh, within the construct of ADF. So those are those are a couple of the goals that I have. That those sound like excellent goals. I I'd like to see I'd like to see that too. <laughs> yeah, me too. I, and one of the things we did this year was we established um, a relationship with the American Forest Foundation. Yes. Uh, and I'm really excited about that. Um, you know. There are some groves that, that plant a huge amount of trees in, uh, in ADF, and I thought perhaps as an organization, if we planted some trees as well and, and partnered with an organization that does that, it helps extend our practices somewhat beyond our, our own boundaries. And we found with the American Forest Foundation that not only were they open to what we do, but, um, you know, they were willing to partner with us. They they know who we are. We just didn't say, oh, yeah, we're just kind of this organization. They know exactly what we are. And, um, Wonderful. And so that's, you know, we, it's good for us to partner with like minds. Yes. And and uh, goes a long, tw- a long way towards um, Isaac's, oh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Vision. Yes. It goes a long way towards Isaac's vision as well. He had a pretty broad vision and had a lot of really good ideas. And I yes. think, you know, we can interpret the, that vision, you know, all kinds of different ways. But I think it's, if you look at it, it's really about excellence, excellence in the things that we do, whether it's, you know, research or practice or artwork. You know, his some of his questions about artwork, I blogged on it not that long ago. But I think that, you know, people by doing public art and even by doing you know, little altars or shrines in their, in their yards that other people might be able to see kind of sparks something in them. So there's a, Isaac's vision is pretty broad. There's Mm -hmm. lots of room in there for growth. Uh, Well, we are coming up on our 30 minute mark here. So I'm going to want to start wrapping things up. Um, But you mentioned that you do a lot of festivals. Do you have any, uh, public appearances coming up soon that you'd like to uh, maybe uh, promote a little bit? Well, let's see. Uh, we have our annual meeting at Tradara this, uh, at, on Memorial Day weekend. Uh, that's our kind of international meeting, and there's some, there's some really, really, really exceptional ADF festivals, and I wish that I had the ability to attend all of them. I just uh, did Texas in Bulk and Pantheacon, uh, and Convocation is going on this weekend in Dearborn, Michigan. Um, the next place that I'm scheduled to talk is, um, it's kind of early in the season yet, but we have uh, Ghost Econ is coming up in New York State. We have uh, Trillium in, in uh, April in Virginia. Um, Three Rivers Festival in Canada, I believe I'll be at that one. Uh, I'm going to be headlining uh, Chrysalis Moon Festival, which is a pan-pagan festival. Uh, that's going to be in a place called Renora in western Michigan. Um, they have um, they have uh, invited us the last few years to do the main rite or opening rite, things of that nature. And I think that people really liked what they saw ADF-wise. Mm-hmm. We had rather large rituals there and... Um, it's a good it's a good way for people to you know see what we're about. So that's coming up in July. Starwood is coming up in July, which I I'm going to be there. Uh, Summerlands, another one of our ADF festivals, 
in Ohio in uh, August, Midnight Flame Festival in September, and um, we also have Harvest Nights in October. I don't want to miss anybody, so, oh, goodness, mm-hmm. I do. But um, right now, I try to, whenever I go to a festival, I try to do workshops. I, I enjoy doing them. I try to make them topical or maybe a little bit different. Um, and it's it's fun to present. We have uh, really good um, really good festivals, and the people that I've had in workshops, and I've done a number of them in ADF, have always been really super. So, um, And I'm one of many presenters, and there's some really great mm-hmm. presenters out there. So, uh, so those are the, those are the things I'm going to be at. Also, Pan Pagan Festival, which is a long running U.S. festival, um, mm-hmm. in August, but, um, Pan Pagan, or Pagan Pride Days as well, et cetera, et cetera. So, mm-hmm. um, I know that was a long answer for a short question. <laughs> no worries. Well, um, maybe soon we can get you out here for our, uh, Beyond the Gates. I would love to or- do that. I know that I had been approached last year and the schedule wasn't quite right to do that, but um, mm-hmm. I have not been um, I have not been to Washington State uh, to Kirk's yet, and I'd really like to go. And I know that you that there's a lot of good things that go on there, uh, yeah. so it's it's on my my short list. <laughs> I mean, if nothing else, you gotta you gotta come out just to to see Trout Lake Abbey. <laughs> I'd love and I'd love to see. You know, I've heard a lot about the groups. Uh, the, the groves and, and proto groves up there, and I would like to see them in action. And um, it's just, I, I love to see what people do. Absolutely. Uh, what is there? Is do you have any uh, final thoughts you'd like to to get out there for our listeners? Um, I just first and foremost, I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk to you tonight. Um, Absolutely. Thank you for coming on. Oh, my goodness. It's, I'm honored to be able to, to talk to you and and to help your podcast, if, if that is indeed the case. Um, Thank you. If anybody has any questions or needs any anything, you know, please don't hesitate to contact either myself or really any of the folks in leadership. They're really there to help, and I, I think that they're all really exceptional people. We, uh, we do care. We want to hear from you if you have an issue. Uh, or concern, or if we're doing something right, let us know. Um, and uh, if we can help, especially if I can help with your devotional practices or give you some direction, um, I can tell you what I've done and I've had some success with. So um, mm-hmm. if we can help, let us know. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you have a public email or, or anything where uh, folks can reach out to you? Absolutely. They can, uh, they can, there's uh, adf. Uh, dash archdruid at adf.org will get to me or you can always write to me at um, night drum n-i-g-h-t-d-r-u-m at juno.com and i'm on facebook as john drum j-o-n-d-r-u-m so if i can uh, drop me a line if i can help and um, i'll do my best to do so all right sounds good well Thank you again so much for coming on to the podcast. Thank and you. It, it was a pleasure talking with you. And you too. Thanks you so much. Thank you. Have uh, have a great day. You too. Oh, Morgan, we call your name Thank you.
ancient land. Your hunger's raw and clear. You make the crops grow rich and strong. As well your geese and A mother of regret Without the touch of your black wings We cannot heal the earth You float upon That you who cut short our lives, you try the warrior's courage sore, our inner souls on earth, without the touch of your red wings, we can. Babylon shining gate. You lead the dead along that path to meet our final fate. The joke's on us. Listening to Part the Mist, a Druid podcast created and hosted by the members of Columbia ADF. Hi, I'm Sean Harbaugh, and uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the hospitality room with uh, at Pantheon that ADF puts together every single year. It's uh, a pretty amazing experience. The whole Pantheon uh, deal. It's the largest gathering of pagan traditions, and people in the United States, if not the world. ADF relies on a number of volunteers to come together and put a room together, which includes a fully working altar. We also put a hospitality spread out. So there's a lot of food out there, snacks, so that when people come into the room, they feel welcome because we're all about hospitality. We have a place set up in the room also so that Various groves, proto-groves, and individuals can put brochures up there talking about their groups and the things that they have to offer and where they're located and any other information that they might have. One of the greatest privileges that we have also is that we host a ritual during the, during the event. That ritual is widely, widely attended. and we, We've gotten upwards of 60, 70, 80 people 
and the tradition there, the hearth culture changes from year to year. Last year we did Hittite. Year before that we did Gaelic. Both those years we called for rain in California, and uh, as you can see now, um, it's raining a lot out on here on the West Coast. I'm getting deluged with rain, so magic does work. We have a great group of volunteers. Our arch druid, Jean Pajano, makes the trip every year and makes himself available for people as they come into the room and they talk about ADF. It's also uh, our regional druid is there, and he or she, uh, in this case she, Victoria Selms, she's there to uh, kind of oversee things. And I'm one of the volunteers, and I have one of my roles that I do. Uh, mostly I like to put together the ritual. Um, and this year's ritual was was really great. It was powerful and intense. And we had a great time slot, which was 9 o'clock on Sunday night. Our hospitality room itself is located on the second floor of the hotel. And the hotel being the Doubletree in San Jose. The second, ninth, and ten floors are dedicated to hospitality rooms. So not only do we get the opportunity to interact with people seeking a new path and we're able to talk to them about it and sit down and discuss all the things, we can do a lot of interfaith work with a lot of other traditions just by manner of location. One of the greatest joys that I get out of going to Pantheon every year is seeing people I only get to see once a year and over the course of the last 10 years, have grown very fond of them, and, and a bond has formed. We've been hosting this room since 2003, and I've been in par a great part of that since 2007. And in that time, ADF and the heathen community and the other polytheists have formed some great friendships. We do cattle raiding and all sorts of crazy fun, too. But most of all, we get to sit down as leaders of our communities and talk to each other about the goings-on. Sometimes at Pantheon there's even controversies, but these controversies lead to big things, usually lead to big thoughts. Um, there was an issue with um, some bias against transgender, and that led to some really great discussion and some changes, some much-needed changes. There was also a uh, an issue with people of color feeling marginalized and not included, and so great strides have been made to make the hospitality rooms and the Pantheon itself more inclusive, including inclusivity, st inclusivity statements, and uh, even posted on our wall at our, at our, in our suite. So the event itself is amazing, and I highly recommend anybody who can make the opportunity once a year in February to come to the to Pantheon. I highly recommend it. It's full of magic. And it's full of good people. And I truly believe that um, it's one of our avenues in the greater pagan sphere to promote pagan values and to show people in the world that we are for real and, and what we do is legitimate. It's a wonderful place. I highly, highly recommend it if anybody can make it out there. Once again, I'm Reverend Sean Harbaugh with ADF, and it has been a pleasure talking to you, and I'm really grateful for having the opportunity. Thank you a lot. Hello, this is Kirk Thomas, and from the archives. Now, today's article is from Oakleaves number 18, and it's entitled Seeking the Wisdom of the Ancestors, a Form of Indo-European Divination, by Kaiser Sereth. In the Irish tale The Sickbed of Cahoolan, a ritual is described in which a white bull is killed. A man eats his fill of its meat, drinks its broth, and goes to sleep after a prayer is spoken over him by four druids. While he sleeps, he has a dream of the man who will become king. In a similar story, told in the destruction of Dederga's hostel, we are further told that the prayer was an incantation of truth, and that the man will die if he lies about what he dreams. These two stories contain most of the essential elements of a form of divination that may be found across a wide swath of the Indo-European domain, from Iceland to India. This article will present the evidence for this technique and attempt to reconstruct its original form. 
In another Irish tale, The Life of St. Berach, four druids lie on rowan hurdles that are covered with the hides of sacrificed bulls. They drink new ale, call on the gods, and wait for a revelation. Other Celtic sources provide numerous examples. For instance, Scottish folklore prescribes that a seer be wrapped in the skin of freshly killed cattle. He is then to be taken to an isolated wild place to await, await his answer. In a version from the Western Islands from 1703, a man is wrapped in a cow's hide and left in a wild place overnight. Invisible friends come to him to tell him what he wants to know. A more complete example that is late, after 1200, but still recognizable is the Welsh The Dream of Ronabwy from the Mabinogion. The title character, while on a search for a renegade prince, is put up for the night in a pathetic excuse for a hall. It is warmed with a fire of chaff, which throws up smoke and chokes everyone. A hag serves Ronabwi and his two men a dinner of barley bread, cheese, and watery milk. When it is time to sleep, they are given a pile of straw and sticks, infested with fleas. Renabwi understandably can't sleep and goes to the far end of the hall where there is a yellow ox skin on a platform. He lies down on that and has a dream in which a youth dressed in yellow and green takes him to King Arthur's court. A parody, to be sure, but parodies must be based on something or they are simply not funny. The Germanic realm provides more fragmentary versions. In the Mariu saga from the 13th century, a man sits on the hide of a freshly skinned, and presumably freshly killed, ox, with squares drawn around it. The devil comes to him to reveal the future. A divination described in the Icelandic saga of Eric the Red involves a hood and a platform. According to German folklore, those who went to a crossroads between 11 and midnight on Christmas or New Year's Eve, and sat on an animal hide, would learn the future. So far, the examples from, from Christian-era sources, that makes the Roman evidence all the more important. In the Aeneid, 7.80, Latinus, troubled by omens, goes to the oracle of Faunus for advice. At this oracle, at a fountain deep in the woods, the priest performs divination by sleeping on the hides of sacrificed sheep. Spirits come to him, including both the gods and the dead. Ovid describes a similar ritual in Fasti 4.649-7. King Numa sacrifices two sheep in a sacred grove, one to Faunus and one to Sleep. The hides are laid on the ground and he is sprinkled with water and wine and puts two beech wreaths on his head. He wraps himself in the fleeces, prays, and then dreams. Faunus appears to him in his sleep with an oracle. Before the ritual, he must abstain from sex, meat, and the wearing of rings. In the Zoroastrian Arda Wiraz Namag, Prologue 1-3, to Wiraz is chosen by lot as the most righteous of men to conduct a divination to ask the departed souls whether Zoroastrianism is the true religion. In a thirty-step wide place, he washes himself and puts on a new garment. He lays a new blanket on some boards and, sitting on it, performs the dron ritual. It's a bread offering modeled on a sacrifice. He honors the dead and eats food, presumably the dron. He then drinks three cups of a mixture of wine and the drug mang. He says grace and falls asleep. While he sleeps, priests chant prayers over him. In his sleep, he is taken on a tour of the land of the dead. Finally, the Chandogya Upanishad, 5.2, preserves a complete ritual of this type to be performed on the night of the full moon. The celebrant is to mix all sorts of herbs with sour milk and honey. He is then to make four offerings of ghee into the fire, the chiefest and best, the most excellent, the firm basis, and the abode. Crawling away from the fire, he takes up the herb, milk, and honey mixture in his hands, and prays over it for preeminence and unity with everything. From the cup, he then drinks four sips, praying to Svatir, god of magic, and the sun when it is not in the sky, as he does so. He cleans the cup and lies down to the west of the fire on a skin or on the ground. If he sees a vision of a woman, his ritual has been successful. 
When the details of these examples, Celtic, Germanic, Indic, and indo iranian are considered together, there is clearly a pattern to which each has made modifications. The form of the proto-ritual seems to have been that a milk-giving animal was sacrificed, and its meat was most likely eaten by the diviner. Consuming the majority of a sacrifice is a standard part of Indo-European sacrificial ritual. The diviner also consumed a sacred drink, either the animal's broth, a substitutionary drink, or an intoxicating beverage. He then lay down on the animal's skin, which was most likely put on a low wooden platform. Prayers were said over him by priests, the ritual is public rather than private, and then he slept. A vision came to him in his sleep from the ancestors. The public nature is important. The ritual may be to determine the next king, or to find proof of Zoroastrianism, or to determine the significance of omens. The public nature may be indicated in the Scottish example by the fact that the seer is wrapped up in the hide first and then must be carried to the site of the divination. That the ritual described in the Chandogya Upanishad is not public is easily explained by the fact that Upanishadic Hinduism replaced corporate sacrifice with individual mysticism. The beings to whom the sacrifice is made is only rarely mentioned. In the Aeneid and Fausti, it is Faunus and sleep. In the Chandogya Upanishad, it is Svatir. In the Arda Viras Namag, the offering is made to the departed souls. The beings that the vision comes from is more often given. In one Irish version, it comes from demons, in the Scottish from invisible friends, in the Icelandic from the devil. The Irish and Icelandic versions are obviously Christianized, and the source given for the vision indicates that the ritual was not considered properly Christian. In the Aeneid, the revelation comes from gods and the dead. In the Chandogya Upanishad, from a woman, and then the Arda Viras Namag, from the souls of the dead. Ranabwi's vision is of King Arthur's court, and thus of the past. Leaving aside the Christianized version, I would like to suggest that the knowledge sought is intended to come from the ancestors. This is clear in the Aeneid. Not only do the dead appear to Latinus, but Faunus is his father, and the Arda Viras Namag, and implied in Ranabwi. Since Vatir is a god of the sun when it is not in the sky, it may be implied in the Chandoga Upanishad as well. He comes from the underworld. The major variation is the absence of sacrifice in some versions. This is easily explained by their cultural contexts. In both Iran and India, animal sacrifice, particularly of cattle, came to be seen as abhorrent. These traditions have therefore replaced animal sacrifice in this ritual in the same way they replaced it in others, with bread in Iran and dairy products in India. And of course, the later versions from Celtic and Germanic sources occur in a culture in which sacrifice is out of the question. In these versions, the sacrificed animal has been reduced to a hide. An interesting secondary detail is the wooden platform, which appears in Ireland, Wales, and Iran, and possibly in Iceland. This may be a liminal device. The seer is lifted up, but not high, putting him neither on the ground nor truly in the air. Some of the Celtic and Germanic examples, and one of the Roman, prescribe wrapping in the hide rather than merely lying on it. In this way, the seer is identified with the sacrificial animal. He is in its skin. This may be intended either as a liminal device between human and animal, between life and death, or so that by this identification with the sacrifice, the, sm the seer might go with the animal to its intended divine target. That the second explanation was the original one is indicated by other details. In most versions, the sacrifice is consumed in some way, eating being a common form of identification. Compare, for instance, the horse sacrifice mentioned by Gerald of Wales, in which a king being inaugurated must not only have intercourse with a mare, who represents the land, but must also eat her flesh, a double identification. Before ending this article, I would like to discuss some side questions. The first involves the nature of the Gaulish god Ogmios. Palmer holds that the identification of the Ogmios with Hercules rested on the Gaulish god being represented with the skin of a sacrificial animal, which was confused with the lion skin Heracles was usually depicted wearing. I would like to suggest that it was the skin used in just this sort of oracular ritual that I have been discussing. 
this would fit in better with the other classical descriptions of Ogmios and with the usual equation of him with the Irish Ogma, than would seeing him from as a Gaulish form of Hercules. If Bruneau is right in describing him as a god who carries off the dead, the divinatory ritual discussed here becomes even more appropriate to him. An interesting non-divinatory parallel comes from an element of the Vedic funeral ritual as given in the Asvalayana Girya Sutra, 4.3.20-27. A goat or cow is sacrificed, and its paces, pieces are put on or next to the corresponding part of the corpse, heart on heart, limbs on limbs, etc. The corpse is finally covered with the animal's skin. Now this is clearly, primarily, an example of equating the dead person and the sacrifice. That, however, makes it all the more interesting. The dead man, covered with the skin of the sacrifice, is conveyed to the land of the dead, and he is presumably on top of a cremation pyre. Is this latter the source of the elevated platform? And could the divinatory ritual as a whole be an attempt to go to the land of the dead in the same way that dead men do? The possibility of a connection between divination and funeral ritual is also raised by the famous funeral described by Ibn Fadlan, and he describes a funeral of the Rus, a Germanic people living in what is now Russia. The relevant portions are that a slave who is going to accompany her master into death drinks an intoxicating beverage and is later lifted over a doorframe and tells those attending of what she sees in the land of the dead. The dead man lies in a ship, and after the rest of the ritual is performed, the ship is set on fire. Since it requires approximately 21 square meters of wood to effectively cremate a human body, unless accelerants were used, a pyre must have been erected, either around the ship or inside it, making a platform for the dead man. I tentatively put forward the suggestion that this funeral ritual may also be a parallel. If so, the elements have been separated. It is not the dead man, obviously, who performs the ritual. His role is to lie in his boat on a pyre, perhaps a substitute for the platform found in the divination ritual. The roles of drinking the intoxicating beverage and observing the land of the dead fall to the slave, who is about to be killed, to accompany her master. Such elements as ritual intercourse and human sacrifice make me hesitant to put too much emphasis on this as a parallel. It is clear, though, that an investigation of Indo-European funeral rites may lead to the origin of the divination ritual. Funerals are themselves liminal rites, and there are strong elements of liminality throughout the Celtic and Germanic traditions. The ritual may be performed at a crossroads, or a new ale consumed, or it is specified that the hide must come from a freshly slain animal. These tend to be lacking in the other traditions, and even some Celtic and Germanic examples, which leads me to believe that, while liminality was not a crucial element of the original ritual, it either was a part of it, or has migrated into the ritual from other ritual practice. Whatever the origin of the ritual, its clear presence in separated but complete form in both the two Irish sources and the Indo-Iranian sphere point towards a shared common Indo-European heritage. The seer, identified with the dead animal, goes where it goes, to the ancestors, and from them the seer acquires knowledge to benefit the community. And we're back! Yes, that was a lot of stuff. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, I know I haven't heard a lot of it yet, so I will be listening to it at home myself. The magic of editing. Yes. <laughs> but, um, so you can find us. You can find us on Facebook. Just search Part the Mist podcast. We have a fan page and a group discussion page there. Uh, you can also find us at, on iTunes and Stitcher, listen to us there, or at our website, ptmpod.lipson.com. And of course, you can always email us, ptmpod at gmail.com. We are accepting musical submissions. We are accepting interview requests. If you want to be interviewed, reach out to us, communicate with us. We'd love to hear from you. Also, if you have ads for your local yes. pagan festival that you might be a part of we'd be more than happy to play that for free so please send those to us as well or if you want something maybe you don't want to record it but you would rather we'll have one of us read it for you we'd be more than happy to do that absolutely don't worry i'll read it yeah not me i, I, I can't <laughs> read all right well let's uh thank apollo
Beautiful Apollo, you have the gifted tongue, you who plays your lyre, you who inspires our words. For everything you've given to us for this podcast, we thank you. We thank you. We'll see you next month. 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 We'll see